Virtualization Environment A virtual machine, VM, is a compute resource that uses software instead of a physical computer to run programs and deploy apps. One or more virtual guest machines run on a physical host machine. Each virtual machine runs its operating system and functions separately from the other VMs, even when they are all running on the same host. This means that, for example, a virtual macOS virtual machine can run on a physical PC. VMware Workstation Pro is the industry standard desktop hypervisor for running virtual machines on Linux or Windows PCs, start your free, fully functional 30-day trial. We will use Workstation Pro during our labs. So you will be able to use an industry standard hypervisor system. Let's go to the download page of Workstation Pro. Googling will directly get you to the download page. After downloading the setup file, we will run the setup file. By clicking the Hide Library button, you can hide or view your VM library. View on the right of the screen option is useful. Kali Linux, formerly known as Backtrack Linux, is an open source, Debian based Linux distribution aimed at advanced penetration testing and security auditing. Kali Linux contains several hundred tools targeted towards various information security tasks, such as penetration testing, security research, computer forensics, and reverse engineering. Kali Linux is a multi-platform solution, accessible and freely available to information security professionals and hobbyists. First, we will go to the Get Kali page. Here you will find many options for your needs and IT environment. We will choose the faster way. We will download the already configured VM image. After downloading the zipped file please extract it to the folder where Kali will stay permanently. After VM installation, you cannot change the folder or remove it. Metasploitable is an intentionally vulnerable Linux virtual machine. This VM can be used to conduct security training, test security tools, and practice common penetration testing techniques. We will download the Metasploitable from SourceForge website. We will use Microsoft Edge Developer VM which is free to use 90 days. At the beginning of the hands-on labs, we will inform you about the lab and the needed settings. During the course, we have many different scenarios and network topology, for that reason here we have not explained the network topology. Computer Network Computer Network is an interconnection of multiple devices, also known as hosts, that are connected using multiple paths to send or receive data or media. Computer networks can also include multiple devices or mediums which help in the communication between two different devices, these are known as network devices and include things such as routers, switches, hubs. Ethernet hub connects broadcast signals to computers within a local area network, LAN, through a process called frame flooding, also known as unicast. It is like one big blast. A hub does not differentiate between MAC addresses, and indeed cannot. It does not have the software required to identify specific targets. 
A hub is essentially an unintelligent device. Each incoming bit is replicated on all other interfaces. A hub is an easiest and least expensive way to construct a network of personal computers together. MAC stands for Media Access Control. It's either a 48-bit or 64-bit address given to a network adapter at the time of a computer's manufacture. A MAC address is the hardware address for that device. An IP address, on the other hand, is a software address. Both of these can be found in that particular computer's network interface card NIC. These addresses allow both hubs and switches to transmit data to a computer. A switch is an intelligent device transmitting to specific MAC addresses within the LAN. It can learn or remember and distinguish between specific addresses by accessing them from a CAM table. The software allows the switch to regulate traffic, eliminating spammy signals and making connected networks highly efficient. A switch costs more, but it not only supports personal computers, but also supports a variety of other IP devices. That brings it into the realm of the Internet Things and the ability to support remote devices within a larger WAN, VLAN, or LAN. Intelligent features allow administrators to turn ports off and on, or filter, through specific ports and manage VLAN security. A network switch generally has 24 to 48 ports. A router is a device that connects two or more packet-switched networks or subnetworks. It serves two primary functions, managing traffic between these networks by forwarding data packets to their intended IP addresses and allowing multiple devices to use the same internet connection. There are several types of routers, but most routers pass data between LANs, local area networks, and WANs, wide area networks. A LAN is a group of connected devices restricted to a specific geographic area. A LAN usually requires a single router. LAN or local area network connects network devices in such a way that personal computers and workstations can share data, tools, and programs. The group of computers and devices are connected together by a switch or stack of switches, using a private addressing scheme as defined by the TCP IP protocol. Private addresses are unique in relation to other computers on the local network. Routers are found at the boundary of a LAN, connecting them to the larger WAN. VLAN is a collection of devices or network nodes that communicate with one another as if they made up a single LAN, when in reality they exist in one or several LAN segments. In a technical sense, a segment is separated from the rest of the LAN by a bridge, router, or switch, and is typically used for a particular department. This means that when a workstation broadcasts packets, they reach all other workstations on the VLAN but none outside it. Metropolitan area network covers a larger area and that of a LAN and smaller area as compared to WAN. It connects two or more computers that are apart but reside in the same or different cities. It covers a large geographical area and may serve as an ISP, Internet Service Provider. MAN is designed for customers who need high-speed connectivity. Speeds of MAN range in terms of MBPs. It's hard to design and maintain a metropolitan area network. Wide Area Network is a computer network that extends over a large geographical area, although it might be confined within the bounds of a state or county L. A WAN could be a connection of LAN connecting to other LANs via telephone lines and radio waves and may be limited to an NTR Pyrise, a corporation, or an organization, or accessible to the public. The technology is high-speed and relatively expensive. OSI model. To minimize proprietary solutions, to create an open market in network systems, and to enable management of communications complexity, the International Organization for Standardization, ISO, has developed a reference model for open communications. This reference model, called the ISO Open Systems Interconnection, OSI, reference model, proposes an abstract and layered model of networking. Specifically, it defines seven layers of abstraction and the functionality of each layer. 
However, it does not define specific protocols that must be used at every layer but gives the concepts of service and protocol that correspond to each layer. Physical layer. These protocols employ methods for bit transmission over physical media and include such typical functions as signal processing, timing, and encoding. Data link control layer. Its protocols establish point-to-point -point communication over a physical or logical link, performing such functions as an organization of bits in data units, frames, organization, error detection, and flow control. Network layer. These protocols deliver data units over a network composed of the links established through the DLC protocols of Layer 2. Part of these protocols is the identification of the route the data units will follow to reach their target. Transport Layer Transport protocols establish end-to-end -end communication between end systems over the network defined by a Layer 3 protocol. Often, transport layer protocols provide reliability, which refers to complete and correct data transfer between end systems. Reliability can be achieved through mechanisms for end-to-end -end error detection, retransmissions, and flow control. Session layer. This layer enables and manages sessions for complete data exchange between end nodes. Sessions may consist of multiple transport layer connections. Presentation layer. This layer is responsible for the presentation of exchanged data in formats that can be consumed by the application layer. Application layer. The application layer includes protocols that implement or facilitate end-to-end -end distributed applications over the network. IP is a routable protocol, meaning it can be sent across networks that handles addressing, routing, and the process of putting data into or taking data out of packets. IP is considered to be connectionless because it does not establish a session with a remote computer before sending data. Data sent via connectionless methods are called datagrams. An IP packet can be lost, delayed, duplicated, or delivered out of sequence and there is no attempt to recover from these errors. Recovery is the responsibility of higher layer protocols, including transport layer protocols such as TCP. Transmission Control Protocol IP is a connectionless protocol, which means that each unit of data is individually addressed and routed from the source device to the target device, and the target does not send an acknowledgement back to the source. That's where protocols such as the Transmission Control Protocol, TCP, come in. TCP is used in conjunction with IP to maintain a connection between the sender and the target and to ensure packet order. For example, when an email is sent over TCP, a connection is established and a three-way handshake is made. First, the source sends an SYN, initial request packet, to the target server to start the dialogue. Then the target server sends an SYNACK packet to agree to the process. Lastly, the source sends an ACK packet to the target to confirm the process, after which the message contents can be sent. The email message is ultimately broken down into packets before each packet is sent out into the internet, where it traverses a series of gateways before arriving at the target device where the group of packets is reassembled by TCP into the original contents of the email. The Domain Name System DNS. The Domain Name System DNS is a system for computers and services connected to the Internet that resolves domain names to IP addresses. It converts human-readable domain names, like www.google.com, into Internet Protocol IP, addresses. Computers can only communicate using a series of numbers, so DNS was developed as a sort of phone book that translates the domain you enter in your browser into a computer-readable IP. Ethernet is a network protocol that controls how data is transmitted over a LAN and is referred to as the IEEE 802.3 protocol. Ethernet is the most popular physical layer LAN technology in use today. It defines the number of conductors that are required for a connection, the performance thresholds that can be expected, and provides the framework for data transmission. A standard Ethernet network can transmit data at a rate of up to 10 megabits per second. User Datagram Protocol, UDP Like IP, UDP is a connectionless and unreliable protocol. 
It doesn't require making a connection if the host to exchange data. Since UDP is an unreliable protocol, there is no mechanism for ensuring that data sent is received. File Transfer Protocol, FTP FTP is used to copy files from one host to another. FTP offers the mechanism for the same in the following manner. FTP creates two processes such as control process and data transfer process at both ends i.e. at the client as well as a server. FTP establishes two different connections, one is for data transfer and the other is for control information. Hypertext Transfer Protocol, HTTP HTTP is a communication protocol. It defines a mechanism for communication between the browser and the web server. It is also called request and response protocol because the communication between browser and server takes place in request and response pairs. Secure Sockets Layer Protocol SSL stands for Secure Sockets Layer and, in short, it's the standard technology for keeping an internet connection secure and safeguarding any sensitive data that is being sent between two systems, preventing criminals from reading and modifying any information transferred, including potential personal details. It does this by making sure that any data transferred between users and sites, or between two systems, remain impossible to read. It uses encryption algorithms to scramble data in transit, preventing hackers from reading it as it is sent over the connection. Secure Shell Protocol Secure Shell is a method for securing remote login from one computer to another. It provides several alternative options for strong authentication, and it protects the communication security and integrity with strong encryption. It is a secure alternative to the non-protected login protocols, such as Telnet, Relogen, and insecure file transfer methods, such as FTP. The Internet Control Message Protocol, ICMP The Internet Control Message Protocol, ICMP, is a protocol that devices within a network use to communicate problems with data transmission. Traceroute and Ping use ICMP. Traceroute and Ping are messages sent regarding whether data was successfully transmitted. When Traceroute is used, the devices that a packet of data went through to get to its destination are displayed in the report. ICMP facilitates ping in that the ICMP echo request and echo reply are used during the ping process. Simple Mail Transfer Protocol SMTP, which stands for Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, is an email protocol used for sending email messages from one email account to another via the Internet. Email protocols are sets of rules that let different email clients and accounts easily exchange information, and SMTP is one of the most common ones alongside POP and IMAP. It is also the only dedicated protocol for sending emails. Devices in a local area network are programmed to communicate using link layer addresses. Switches are not configured for a standard that will allow destination decisions to be based on IP within the same broadcast domain. A device that is not connected to the internet will not have an IP address. In that case, the network has to resort to using MAC addresses for communication. If a device wants to communicate with another device in the same LAN, it needs to know the MAC address of the other device's network interface. This allows for the communication between the two end devices to be unicast. ARP is a request response or request reply protocol in which one device sends a request to another device asking for some information, to which the other device will reply with the required information. It is a message exchange pattern. Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol DHCP stands for Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol and is a network protocol used on IP networks where a DHCP server automatically assigns an IP address and other information to each host on the network so they can communicate efficiently with other endpoints. In addition to the IP address, DHCP also assigns the subnet mask, default gateway address, the domain name server, DNS address, and other pertinent configuration parameters. DHCP Server, a network device running the DCHP service that holds IP addresses and related configuration information. This is most typically a server or a home router, but could be anything that acts as a host, such as an SD-WAN appliance. 
most probably every computer user saw this IP config table. When you select to obtain an IP address automatically your home router will assign your computer an IP address, gateway, and DNS. In this lab, we will what happens in the network when we are interacting with it. We will analyze network traffic with Wireshark and see how protocols flow through network. Our client is Kali and our server is Metasploitable. Let's create some network traffic. We will open our web server's HTTP pages and see what happens. When you type protocol name to Wireshark search line, you can flight or given protocol traffic. Now let's examine SSL protocol traffic. Here we see SSL handshake traffic between server and client. Now let's check DNS traffic. As you see we received www.google.com's DNS address from DNS server. We will open a SSH session on our server. We are typing username and password from Sfadmin at web server. In this traffic, we see SSH key exchange between client and server. After key exchange, our encrypted session has seriated. Now our commands are sent to server encrypted. Now we will open a FTP session on the server and see what happens in network. Because it is not secured FTP or SFTP, we can see traffic in clear text. We will create ICMP traffic by sending ping request to server. Send email is a tool for sending mail directly from terminal. This command will interact with Gmail SMTP server via SMTP protocol. Now we will change our Kali machine's network settings to bridge mode. After that we will receive a new IP address from our home router's DHCP service.
Finally, we will check ARP protocol. After changing our network, we have started to receive ARP messages from devices in our home network. Defense in depth is an approach to cybersecurity in which a series of defensive mechanisms are layered to protect valuable data and information. If one mechanism fails, another steps up immediately to thwart an attack. This multi-layered approach with intentional redundancies increases the security of a system as a whole and addresses many different attack vectors. The defense in-depth concept was originally conceived by the U.S. National Security Agency, NSA, and takes its name from a common military strategy. A defense in-depth cybersecurity strategy is also sometimes referred to as a castle approach because it mirrors the layered defenses of a medieval castle. Before you can penetrate a castle you are faced with the moat, ramparts, drawbridge, towers, battlements, and so on. A layered approach to security can be applied to all levels of IT systems. From the lone laptop accessing the internet from the coffee shop to the 50,000 user NTR Pyrise WAN, defense in depth can significantly improve your security profile. No organization can be ever be fully protected by a single layer of security. Where one door may be closed, others will be left wide open, and hackers will find these vulnerabilities very quickly. However, when you use a series of different defenses together, such as firewalls, malware scanners, intrusion detection systems, data encryption, and integrity auditing solutions, you effectively close the gaps that are created by relying on a singular security solution. In terms of computer network defense, defense in-depth measures only should not prevent security breaches, they should give an organization time to detect and respond to an attack, thereby reducing and mitigating the impact of a breach. The function of the Security Operations Center, SOC, is to monitor, prevent, detect, investigate, and respond to cyber threats around the clock. SOC teams are charged with monitoring and protecting the organization's assets, including intellectual property, personnel data, business systems, and brand integrity. The SOC team implements the organization's overall cybersecurity strategy and acts as the central point of collaboration in coordinated efforts to monitor, assess, and defend against cyber attacks. Tools used by the SOC scan the network 24 hours to flag any abnormalities or suspicious activities. Monitoring the network around the clock allows the SOC to be notified immediately of emerging threats, giving them the best chance to prevent or mitigate harm. Monitoring tools can include a CM or an EDR, the most advanced of which can use behavioral analysis to teach systems the difference between regular day-to-day -day operations and actual threat behavior, minimizing the amount of triage and analysis that must be done by humans. Incident response is a term used to describe the process by which an organization handles a data breach or cyber attack, including the way the organization attempts to manage the consequences of the attack or breach, the incident. Ultimately, the goal is to effectively manage the incident so that the damage is limited and both recovery time and costs, as well as collateral damage such as brand reputation, are kept at a minimum. Organizations should, at minimum, have a clear incident response plan in place. This plan should define what constitutes an incident for the company and provide a clear, guided process to be followed when an incident occurs. Additionally, it's advisable to specify the teams, employees, or leaders responsible for both managing the overall incident response initiative and those tasked with taking each action specified in the incident response plan. Malware or malicious software is used by cyber criminals to cause significant damage to the victim. It damages either the server, host system, or network. Cyber criminals include attackers, hackers, nation states. The damage caused could disrupt normal operations of a computer, a network, steal important and confidential information stores, bypass access controls to gain access to confidential arenas. It can cause harm to the victims in unimaginable ways. The victims could be individuals, organizations, businesses, governments, and even important bodies working towards the improvement of the world. A report states that around 200,000 malware samples are being caught every day. 
This in turn calls for a strong process that will detect any malicious content right at the start and help to put together a process that will avert the situation or be able to do significant damage control. Malware analysis can be described as the process of understanding the behavior and purpose of a suspicious file or URL. The output of the process aids in detecting and mitigating any potential threat. The static analysis does not analyze the code when it is running. Instead, it examines files for malicious intent. This makes it useful to identify infrastructure, packed files, and libraries. Some technical indicators can be used to determine if the file is malicious. However, since it does not run the code, it is difficult to detect sophisticated malware. Dynamic analysis executes any suspicious malicious code in a secure environment called a sandbox. It enables security professionals to watch the malware in action and not impact the risk of infecting the system. It offers deeper visibility to reveal the true nature of the threat. It also reduces the time to rediscover a file with malicious code. Hackers and adversaries often hide code in a sandbox that will not run until some conditions are met. Cyber threat hunting is a proactive security search through networks, endpoints, and datasets to hunt malicious, suspicious, or risky activities that have evaded detection by existing tools. Thus, there is a distinction between cyber threat detection versus cyber threat hunting. Threat detection is a somewhat passive approach to monitoring data and systems for potential security issues, but it's still a necessity and can aid a threat hunter. Proactive cyber threat hunting tactics have evolved to use new threat intelli, gents, on previously collected data to identify and categorize potential threats in advance of the attack. Log management. The SOC is responsible for collecting, maintaining, and regularly reviewing the log of all network activity and communications for the entire organization. This data helps define a baseline for normal network activity, can reveal the existence of threats, and can be used for remediation and forensics in the aftermath of an incident. Many SOCs use a SIEM to aggregate and correlate the data feeds from applications, firewalls, operating systems, and endpoints, all of which produce their internal logs. SIEM captures event data from a wide range of sources across an organization's entire network. Logs and flow data from users, applications, assets, Cloud environments and networks are collected, stored, and analyzed in real time, giving IT and security teams the ability to automatically manage their network's event log and network flow data in one centralized location. Some CM solutions also integrate with third party threat intelli, gents, feeds to correlate their internal security data against previously recognized threat signatures and profiles. Integration with real-time threat feeds enables teams to block or detect new types of attack signatures. Event Correlation and Analytics Event correlation is an essential part of any CM solution. Utilizing advanced analytics to identify and understand intricate data patterns, event correlation provides insights to quickly locate and mitigate potential threats to business security. CM solutions significantly improve mean time to detect and mean time to respond for IT security teams by offloading the manual workflows associated with the in-depth analysis of security events. Network Security Technologies Network security is a broad term that covers a multitude of technologies, devices, and processes. Today's network architecture is complex and is faced with a threat environment that is always changing and attackers that are always TLing to find and exploit vulnerabilities. These vulnerabilities can exist in a broad number of areas, including devices, data, applications, users, and locations. For this reason, there are many network security management tools and applications in use today. Firewall Firewall technology evolved to protect the internet from unauthorized users on the internet. A firewall is a combination of hardware and software technology. 
The firewall enables the network administrator to centralize access control to the network. A firewall logs every packet that enters and leaves the network. Firewall provides several types of protection, including the following. Block unwanted traffic. Direct incoming traffic to more trustworthy internal nodes. Hide vulnerable nodes that cannot easily be secured from external threats. Log traffic to and from the network. Packet filtering is one of the simplest and primary means of achieving network firewalls. Filters are specialized components present in the firewall, which examines data passing in and out of the firewall. The incoming and outgoing firewall packets are compared against a standard set of rules for allowing them to pass through or be dropped. In most cases, the rule base, commonly known as the rule set, is predefined based on a variety of metrics. Rules can include source and destination IP addresses, source and destination port numbers, and protocols used. Packet filtering generally occurs at layer 3 of the OSI model and employs some of the following metrics to allow or deny packets through the firewall. The source IP address of the incoming packets. Normally, IP packets indicate where a particular packet originated. A packet's approval and denial could be based on the originating IP addresses. Many unauthorized sites can be blocked based on their IP addresses. In this way, irrelevant and unwanted packets can be curtailed from reaching legitimate hosts inside the network. For example, a significant amount of spam and unwanted advertisements are aimed at third-party businesses, causing wastage of bandwidth and computational resources. Packet filtering using source IP-based rule sets can effectively eliminate much of such unwanted messages. The source IP address of the incoming destination IP addresses are the intended location of the packet at the receiving end of a transmission. Unicast packets have a single destination IP address and are normally intended for a single machine. Multicast or broadcast packets have a range of destination IP addresses and normally are destined for multiple machines on the network. Rule sets can be devised to block traffic to a particular IP address on the network to lessen the load on the target machine. Such measures can also be used to block unauthorized access to highly confidential machines on internal networks. The type of internet protocols that the packet may contain. Layer 2 and Layer 3 packets carry the type of protocol being used as part of their header structure, intended for appropriate handling at the destination machines. Filtering can be based on the protocol information that the packets carry. Though packet filtering is accomplished at the OSI models layer 3 and below, layer 4 attributes, such as TCP requests, acknowledgement messages, sequence numbers, and destination ports, can be incorporated in devising the filters. Stateful packet inspection is a technology used by stateful firewalls to determine which packets to allow through the firewall. It works by examining the contents of a data packet and then comparing them against data pertaining to packets that have previously passed through the firewall. Stateful packet filtering keeps track of all connections on the network, making sure they are all legitimate. Network-based static packet filtering also examines network connections, but only as they come in, focusing on the data in the packet's headers. This data provides less information to the firewall, limiting it to where it came from and where it is going. A DMZ, short for Demilitarized Zone, is a network, physical or logical, used to connect hosts that provide an interface to an untrusted external network usually the internet while keeping the internal, private network usually the corporate network separated and isolated from the external network. As systems that are most vulnerable to attack are those that provide services to users outside of the local area network, such as email, web and domain name system, DNS, servers, they are quarantined inside a DMZ, from where they have limited access to the private network. Hosts in the DMZ can communicate with both the internal and external networks, but communications with internal network hosts are tightly restricted. The DMZ is isolated using a security gateway firewall to filter traffic between the DMZ and the private network. The DMZ itself also has a security gateway in front of it to filter incoming traffic from the external network.
PFSense software is a free, open-source customized distribution of FreeBSD specifically tailored for use as a firewall and router that is entirely managed by a web interface. In this lab, you will learn how to set up firewall rules. By setting up rules, you will be able to block and allow network traffic of your clients and servers. In the first part of the lab we will learn how to set up PFSense as a virtual machine then we will connect our Kali as a client to LAN interface of PFSense and connect Metasploitable web server to DMZ interface of PFSense. Let's open pfsense.org and go to download page. Here we will select DVD ISO installer. We will create a new virtual machine. Please browse your downloaded ISO file. We will add three network adapters. First one is the WAN interface, VMNet 8 network. DHCP will automatically assign the interface IP address. Second one is LAN and third one is the DMZ interface. We will give IP addresses of interfaces during installation. We will select BIOS boot option. We assign the firewall management web interface to LAN interface by saying yes to the HTTP configurator option.
let's open wired connection settings and give a static IP address from the LAN network. Gateway is the LAN network interface address. We will enter the 8.8.8.8 Google DNS server address for DNS. The firewall's interfaces can be seen here. Our machine did not get an IP address because there is no DHCP in the DMZ network. We will manually give the static IP address. In this lab lesson, we will learn how to grant access authorizations from the corporate internal network to the internet and the corporate DMZ subnet. We will learn how to harden the access to the web server in the corporate DMZ subnet and to give the necessary access authorizations. We will also observe how unauthorized access is blocked by the firewall. First, we will authorize LAN users to access ports 80 and 443 to the WAN network and provide access to the metasploitable machine, which is in the role of external server. We will then try to access google.com. However, since we have not yet authorized access to the DNS service, we will see that the access is blocked. Then we will give access to google.com by giving DNS authorization. We will use virtual machines 1 and 2 included in the topology. We will set up our metasploitable machine to run on the one network. We will try to open our external web server. For now, our firewall is blocking access to the server because there is no access rule defined. First click Firewall, then select the Rules tab from the pop-up menu. Here we see Interfaces. We will select LAN tab. Then click Add button. We will choose Protocol TCP. Then choose source IP address as LAN net. Port numbers will be HTTP 80. Now we will do the same for HTTPS 443.
don't forget to apply changes. Otherwise, our rules will not work. Now let's regain access to our external web server. Since we have provided the necessary permissions, we have provided access to a web server located on the external network from the internal network. Let's try to access google.com. As you can see, the address cannot be accessed. We have seen the DNS service in the network protocols lesson. When trying to access a server with the DNS name here google.com, not the IP address, the DNS service will work first. However, the site cannot be accessed because DNS access is closed yet. Now, we will give access to DNS. Don't forget to choose UDP as protocol. As you have learned before DNS works usually with UDP. Since we gave the necessary DNS authorization, internal network users were able to access google.com. In this scenario, First we will try to access from external client Kali to the DMZ server to see that we can't access it. Then access to an external server because there is no firewall to protect it. Second we will enter the NAT rule for incoming HTTP traffic from WAN to DMZ. Third we will try to access from the internal client to the DMZ server via FTP port to see that we can't access it. Then we will enter FW for allowing this traffic. Afterward, we will try to access from an external client to the same server and see that we can't access it. We will see how a firewall protects the DMZ servers from external unsecure FTP access. In order for a device to communicate with other devices on the internet, it must have a public IP address, but as you know, addresses, approximately 3.3 billion, are limited in IPv4. Since IP addresses are a scarce resource, internet service providers that enable us to connect to the internet from our homes and workplaces provide a single public IP to their subscribers. NAT, Network Address Translation, is a method that allows multiple devices in the same network to access the internet using the same public IP. In our topology, a computer on the internet cannot know the IP address of a computer in the DMZ subnet. Only the one interface address of our firewall is open to the internet. Access to this address is blocked by the firewall. To access an HTTP request from the internet to the DMZ web server, a NAT port forwarding rule will need to be entered. We are on external Kali. We will try to access the DMZ web server via the public IP of the one network. We can't access the web server because firewall blocks all incoming traffic to the WAN interface. We will switch to internal Kali for editing firewall rules. We will select NAT option. Here we will select the single IP option. Then enter the WAN interface IP address. Redirect IP address is our DMZ web server's internal IP address. Now let's switch to external Kali and check DMZ web server again. As you see external Kali can access the DMZ web server via WAN public IP address. We will try to access to DMZ web server from WAN client Kali via FTP port. As you see we can't access you know the reason well, firewall.
We will add FTP rule for lawn to DMZ traffic. We are now switching to external Kali and try to access the DMZ web server via FTP. But we can't access it because firewall blocks us. Then we will try to access the external web server. At this time we can access it because there is no firewall protecting the external web server. Intrusion detection is a set of techniques and methods that are used to detect suspicious activity both at the network and host level. Intrusion detection systems fall into two basic categories. Signature-based intrusion detection systems and anomaly detection systems. Intruders have signatures, like computer viruses, that can be detected using the software. You try to find data packets that contain any known intrusion-related signatures or anomalies related to internet protocols. Based upon a set of signatures and rules, the detection system can find and log suspicious activity and generate alerts. Anomaly-based intrusion detection usually depends on packet anomalies present in protocol header parts. A signature is a pattern that you look for inside a data packet. A signature is used to detect one or multiple types of attacks. For example, the presence of scripts in a packet going to your web server may indicate an intruder activity. Signatures may be present in different parts of a data packet depending upon the nature of the attack. For example, you can find signatures in the IP header, transport layer header, TCP or UDP header, or application layer header or payload. Usually, IDS depends upon signatures to find out about intruder activity. Some vendor-specific IDS needs updates from the vendor to add new signatures and a new type of attack is discovered. Anomaly-based intrusion detection systems can alert you to suspicious behavior that is unknown. Instead of searching for known threats, an anomaly-based detection system utilizes machine learning to train the detection system to recognize a normalized baseline. The baseline represents how the system normally behaves, and then all network activity is compared to that baseline. Rather than searching for known indicators of compromises, anomaly-based IDS simply identifies any out-of-the-ordinary behavior to trigger alerts. IPS is an inline device, that is it sits directly on the path that packets take as they traverse a network. Examples of inline devices are routers and firewalls which are responsible for passing IP packets between connected networks. When an IPS is inline between the attacker and the intended target system not only can attacks be detected through any number of mechanisms but individual attack packets can be stopped in their tracks. Another important countermeasure available to inline IPS is application layer data modification. This technique allows the IPS to alter packet payload data so that the application layer attack becomes useless before it reaches its intended target. Whitelisting is the ability to easily specify IP addresses of networks that should never be the subject of an automated response. For example, IP addresses associated with systems that are critical to a network like DNS and upstream routers should not be automatically blocked by an IPS. Some active response systems include the ability to whitelist IP addresses and networks and to specify which protocols should be ignored. Suricata is a high-performance network IDS, IPS, and network security monitoring engine. Open source and owned by a community-run nonprofit foundation, the Open Information Security Foundation. PF Sense allows downloading and using Sense Suricata packages. 
so you can add the IDS feature to the PFSense firewall. Path Traversal Attack, also known as Directory Traversal, aims to access files and directories that are stored outside the webroot folder. By manipulating variables that reference files with dot dot slash sequences and their variations or by using absolute file paths, it may be possible to access arbitrary files and directories stored on the file system including application source code or configuration and critical system files. In Linux systems, password file is used to keep track of every registered user that has access to a system. Classic firewalls will be ineffective when an IP address attacks a service that is allowed access. Because firewalls don't do packet inspection. As we saw in the previous lesson, package inspection can be performed by IDS. During the lab, we will first access the DMZ web server's password file from external Kali machine by using directory traversal attack. We will be successfully access password file because our DMZ server's HTTP service is open to internet traffic. Then we will add Suricata packets to PFSense. After this process, we will try to access again to password file and see that we were blocked by Suricata rules. Before applying IDS hardening, let's test whether we can perform a directory traversal attack from the external network. We log into the DWA application using the words admin as the username and password as the password. DWA was developed for testing application attacks and has three different security level settings. We set the security level to low for a successful directory traversal attack. To access the password file located under the etc folder, we send our web request by adding dot dot and slash six times after the DWA slash vulnerabilities. After sending the web request, the content of the password file could be viewed. The attack was not blocked by the firewall, as the attacker IP had access to the HTTP protocol. This will change after the addition of the IDS feature. Now let's switch to the Kali machine in the LAN network and open the PFSense interface. Then we will go to the Package Management tab and download the Suricata packages. Let's open the Suricata section added to the Services tab to make the necessary settings. We select Emerging Threats and Snort GPL 2 options. Other settings remain as default. Now we go to the Updates tab and select the Update Force tab. We go to the WAN tab and install the Suricata on the WAN interface. We make Suricata logs appear in system logs. Set alert as log level. We go to the WAN Categories tab and click the Select All Rules button. Then we activate the Enable All option. Let's go back to the Interface tab and restart the service on the WAN interface. Then, let's check if there is an incoming alarm by opening the alert tab. There are no alarms at the moment, as there is no attack.
Let's go to the external Kali machine and repeat the directory traversal attack several times. Let's see if IDS will generate intrusion detection logs. When IDS logs are analyzed, we see that the attack was detected and recorded by IDS. Attack traffic is not blocked because block mode is not active yet. We activate the block offenders tab by going to the one interface settings. This mode should be used with caution, as activating the block mode in a network with a lot of false positive events will often result in service interruptions. Let's repeat the attack by switching to the outer Kali machine. As can be seen, the attack traffic is interrupted and the password file can no longer be viewed. When the Suricata logs are examined, it will be seen that the IP address of the external network Kali machine has been added to the block list. After the attacker's IP address was removed from the block list, with a clean web request it can view the homepage again. A web application firewall sits between a company's web applications and the requests coming in from the internet. Via reverse proxy, it monitors, filters, or blocks data packets as they travel to and from a web application. In doing so, it attempts to screen out potentially harmful traffic that may enable web exploits. Reverse proxy. In networking and web traffic, a proxy is a device or server that acts on behalf of other devices. It sits between two entities and performs a service. Proxies are hardware or software solutions that sit between the client and the server in order to manage requests and sometimes responses. Typically, a reverse proxy server sits in front of web servers and forwards client requests to those web servers. The requested resources are then returned to the client, appearing as if they originated from the proxy server itself. This provides an additional level of abstraction and control to ensure the smooth flow of network traffic between clients and servers. The difference between a web application firewall and intrusion prevention system. An IPS is a more broadly focused security product. It is typically signature and policy based, meaning it can check for well known vulnerabilities and attack vectors based on a signature database and established policies. The IPS establishes a standard based on the database and policies, then sends alerts when any traffic deviates from the standard. The signatures and policies grow over time as new vulnerabilities are known. In general, IPS protects traffic across a range of protocol types such as DNS, SMTP, Telnet, RDP, SSH, and FTP. IPS typically operates and protects layers 3 and 4. The network and session layers, although some may offer limited protection at the application layer. A web application firewall protects the application layer and is specifically designed to analyze each HTTP and HTTPS request at the application layer. It is typically user, session, and application aware, cognizant of the web apps behind it and what services they offer. Because of this, you can think of a web application firewall as the intermediary between the user and the app itself, analyzing all communications before they reach the app or the user. SSL Inspection For intercepted HTTPS traffic, the proxy server or web application firewall decrypts the outbound traffic, accesses the clear text HTTP request, and can use any Layer 7 application to process the traffic, such as by looking into the plain text URL and allowing or blocking access on the basis of the corporate policy and URL reputation. If the policy decision is to allow access to the origin server, the proxy server forwards the re-encrypted request to the destination service, on the origin server. The proxy decrypts the response from the origin server, accesses the clear text HTTP response, and optionally applies any policies to the response. 
the proxy then re-encrypts the response and forwards it to the client. If the policy decision is to block the request to the origin server, the proxy can send an error response, such as HTTP 403, to the client. Burp proxy works in conjunction with the browser that you are using to access the target application. During lab we will send HTTP requests to web applications. Our requests will be met by the Burp proxy first. In the Burp interface, we will analyze the request and decide whether it should pass. We open Kali and Metasploitable machines to create the lab environment. Both need to be on the same VM net. We open Burp, a proxy application. After the opening, we continue with Next Next. We will use the Proxy tab. We will continue with the Ready Proxy settings by selecting the Use Burp Embedded Browser option. Manual proxy settings will be required when the Use Another Browser option is selected. Now let's open the Google.com website. As you can see, there is a lot of web traffic in the background of the site, which has a simple Google text on the front interface. Requests are first met by the Burp proxy, and when forwarded, they are forwarded to the target server. Let's search for the word test. As can be seen, many requests are transmitted in the background until the test word is searched, and then the test word comes next. Now let's practice with the applications on Metasploitable. For this, let's find out the IP address first. We will click on the DWA application on the page that comes through the browser. We will send the request to DAV page by changing this request on the proxy. As a result, the request on the proxy will reach the web server and we will see the DVA page instead of the DWA page. Let's enter our username and password in the DWA application. As can be seen, the values we entered in the login page can be seen on the proxy interface. Now, let's change the security level value that we changed on the web page before by entering the new value on the proxy. The new value is assigned by adding the low value to the request on the proxy.
Finally, we perform the directory traversal attack. The request to view the password page will be visible on the proxy. If there was a web application firewall currently performing this operation, it would catch this malicious request and drop the request. And we would see the warning page. A URL, or Uniform Resource Locator, is the string of text that appears in the address bar of a browser. URLs indicate precisely where a user is on the internet, somewhat like a residential address. URLs are more specific than domain names. A URL can refer to exact web pages or files hosted at a domain, not just the domain itself. URL filtering ensures that the users of your network cannot access web assets that are considered a risk for web security or are not allowed because they contain inappropriate topics, malwares or adwares and for other reasons. The filtering process uses blocking lists, category information, and reputation scores for the URLs of web assets and blocks or allows access accordingly. URL filtering can be done by identifying a group of websites either on a page-by-page -page basis or a category basis, wherein all websites related to a particular category are blocked, such as entertainment, gambling, jobs, employment, news, social media, gaming, pornography, or known phishing sites. URL filters can also be used to block inappropriate website content being accessed through search engines and image searches done via Google, Yahoo, or Bing. PF Blocker NG has two core uses. Inbound and outbound traffic filtering. PF Blocker NG can filter inbound and outbound traffic against IP lists and apply GOIP restrictions by allowing or denying traffic to from specific countries. The latter functionality can be very useful if you open ports on your WAN. Blocking ads and malicious sites through DNS blackholing. PF Blocker NG can block ads and access to malicious sites through DNS filtering. As you browse the web, your DNS requests are checked against a block list. If there's a match, the request is blocked. It's a great way to block ads without using a proxy server. We're going to look at filtering inbound and outbound traffic against IP and URL lists. During lab we will use internal Kali machine and PFSense firewall. First, we will configure PF blocker ing. We will commit a blacklist URL list. Finally, try to access an URL from the list and see that we cannot access it. First, we open the pfSense interface. Then we go to the packet manager menu and search for the word block. We install PF Blocker in development 3.1 from the results we see by clicking it. After the installation is completed, we open the PF Blocker in tab from the firewall menu. The setup wizard screen will appear. When installing with the wizard, if there are any previous settings, they will be deleted. We proceed to the finish screen, leaving the installation settings in the default settings. After the first installation, we need to update the system. For this, we click the force update and reload all tabs. Now let's go to the General Settings tab. 
we leave the settings in this tab as default. We will go to the IP version 4 tab and make the necessary adjustments for the URL blocking feature. You can find many blacklist IP lists on the internet. We download a sample list from the shallow website and select IP URL addresses that provide anonymous VPN service. Thus, we will be preventing anonymous VPN use by LAN users. We will show the example of blocking access to social media during lab. For this reason, we are preparing a custom list by adding the anonymous VPN services we have chosen to the social media list we have created. We have to give a name to our IP version 4 settings. We save the settings by giving the test name. In order for the block rules we created to be valid, we need to update the system. Before that, let's go to the Instagram address and see that we can access it because the rules are still not active. Now let's make the final settings of our test rule. Let's activate the deny both option for the rule to work bidirectionally, and the once a day option for it to be updated once a day. After that, let's go to the update tab and update the system with the IP option, since we only operate on the IP tab. When the update logs are examined, we can see that the custom URL block list we created has become active. When we open the firewall rules tab, we can see that the rule for the URL block lists we have created has been added to the rules list. Now let's go to the Instagram page again and try to refresh the page. As can be seen, the page no longer responds to the refresh request. Let's go back to the PF blocker in menu and open the report section in the alert tab. In this section, the logs of the rules we have written can be seen. As you can see, the Instagram URL address has been blocked. Unified Threat Management, 
commonly abbreviated as UTM, is an information security term that refers to a single security solution, and usually a single security appliance, that provides multiple security functions at a single point on the network. A UTM appliance will usually include functions such as, antivirus, anti-spyware, anti-spam, network firewalling, intrusion detection and prevention, content filtering and leak prevention. Some units also provide services such as remote routing, network address translation, and virtual private network support. The most common features of UTMs are Firewall URL filtering IPS IPsec, SSL and VPN Web antivirus User and application control Quality of service Anti-spam UTM allows for the quicker detection of incoming security threats. This is because the centralized system is more up-to-date, operates faster, and offers a common consolidated platform where multifaceted threats can be detected. Advanced Persistent Threats APT, and polymorphic attacks affect your system using multiple technologies and code changes that can be difficult to detect under single component technologies that do not operate in unison. Organizations can benefit with significant cost savings by consolidating their network security management. A centralized framework reduces the number of devices that are needed, as well as the number of staff that were previously required to manage multiple devices. Centralized integration and management. A network security system contains multiple components, such as firewall, VPN, application control, among others, that can be cumbersome to control separately. UTM offers a framework that consolidates all the functions of the security system under one management console. This makes the system easier to monitor and gives operators the ability to pinpoint specific components of the UTM that may need attention for specific functions. UTM gives users the ability to possess flexible solutions to help cope with today's complex networking environments. This flexibility is achieved by offering a wide array of security technologies from which organizations can pick and choose what is most relevant to them. There is also the option to acquire a single licensing model with all the technologies included which helps avoid the purchase of multiple modules which can be difficult to manage under one umbrella. Network access control is the act of keeping unauthorized users and devices out of a private network. Organizations that give certain devices or users from outside of the organization occasional access to the network can use network access control to ensure that these devices meet corporate security compliance regulations. NAC solutions block a significant hole in network security by denying network access to non-compliant user devices. NAC client agents, whether running on a managed laptop or a user's cell phone, ensure all devices connected to the network have the latest security updates. The quarantine and remediation systems provide a final line of defense to keep compromised and non-compliant devices off the network. User devices and endpoints are the primary vectors for cyber attacks. NAC solutions give security professionals detailed views of the devices connected to their networks and the security posture of each device. This visibility provides actionable insights into the network security risks. NAC solutions are built into a company's network infrastructure which automatically execute NAC policies. As users and devices navigate through a highly segmented network, the NAC solutions automation reduces administrative overhead. A network access control list, ACL, is another layer of security that acts as a stateless firewall on a subnet level. A network ACL is a numbered list of rules that routers or switches evaluates in order, starting with the lowest numbered rule, to determine whether traffic is allowed in or out of any subnet associated with the network ACL. Honeypots are a somewhat controversial tool in the arsenal of those we can use to improve our network security. A honeypot can detect, monitor, 
and sometimes tamper with the activities of an attacker. Honeypots are configured to deliberately display vulnerabilities or materials that would make the system attractive to an attacker. This might be an intentionally vulnerable service, an outdated and unpatched operating system, or other similar items that might serve as bait for an attacker. As part of the monitoring process, cybersecurity professionals can determine the origin of a cyber attack, the sophistication level of the attacker, commonly used techniques by adversaries, the most attractive targets within the network, the effectiveness of existing cybersecurity measures in preventing such attacks. In this way, a honeypot helps organizations reverse engineer their security policies and procedures to actively protect against known threats and specific adversarial techniques. In this lab application, we will test the honeypod feature of the Pentest Box application on Kali Linux. We will use two Kali machines during the lab. Both machines will be on the same VM net. One Kali will take on the role of attacker, while the other Kali will take on the role of honeypod. Attacker will create traffic to web server and SSH port. We will observe the traffic generated by the attacker on the honeypod. In order not to disturb the PFSense lab environment, we will take the clone of the external Kali machine. We will perform a fast and resource-free operation by choosing the linked clone option in the clone process. Log into your clone Kali Linux machine as an admin user. Open a terminal window and download Pentbox with the command. Once that file has finished downloading, extract the archive with the command. This will create a new directory named pentbox 1.8. Change into that new directory with cd pentbox 1.8. The next step is to run the pentbox ruby script with the command. We will use fast configuration. This will create a fake website on port 80. Now let's learn the Honeypot's IP address. After we will switch to Attacker Kali and send a web request to the Honeypot. After getting a fake web page, we will switch to Honeypot. As can see, the intrusion has been detected by the Honeypot. Now we will run another honeypot process for SSH service. This time we will select the manual configuration option. We will switch to the attacker and send SSH requests to the honeypot.
IPsec, also known as Internet Protocol, IP, Security, or IP Security Protocol, describes a security service infrastructure built for IP network traffic. IPsec lays out a framework for data security at the IP layer, it refers to protocols designed to provide this security through authentication and encryption of IP network packets. IPsec defines the encryption algorithms used to encrypt, decrypt, and authenticate packets. In addition, the protocols required for secure key exchange and key management are also covered by IPsec. IPsec initially defined two mechanisms to ensure security in IP packets, the encapsulating security payload protocol, which is a way to encrypt data in IP packets, and the authentication header protocol, which is a way to digitally sign IP packets. The Internet Key Exchange Protocol is used to manage the cryptographic keys used by IPsec servers. Benefits of IPsec When IPsec is implemented in a firewall or router, it provides strong security that can be applied to all traffic crossing the perimeter. Traffic within a company or workgroup does not incur the overhead of security-related processing. IPsec in a firewall is resistant to bypass if all traffic from the outside must use IP and the firewall is the only means of entrance from the Internet into the organization. IPsec is below the transport layer, TCP, UDP, and so is transparent to applications. There is no need to change software on a user or server system and IPsec is implemented in the firewall or router. Even if IPsec is implemented in end systems, upper layer software, including applications, is not affected. IPsec can be transparent to end users. There is no need to train users on security mechanisms, issue keying material on a per-user basis, or revoke keying material when users leave the organization. IPsec can provide security for individual users if needed. This is useful for off-site workers and for setting up a secure virtual subnetwork within an organization for sensitive applications. The growth and widespread use of the Internet has been coupled with the use of encryption technology to solve specific types of private communication channels, virtual private networks, VPNs. VPNs function like private leased lines, they encapsulate and encrypt the data being transmitted, and they use authentication to ensure that only approved users can access the VPN. However, rather than having to use an inexpensive leased line, VPNs provide a means of secure point-to-point -point communications over the public internet. A virtual private network connection occurs within the context of a TCP IP tunnel. A tunnel is a channel or pathway over a packet network used by the virtual private network that runs through the internet from one endpoint to another. The term tunnel can be misleading because it implies that there is a single cable joining one endpoint to another and that no one but approved users can send or receive data using that cable. In reality, a virtual private network uses a virtual tunnel between two endpoints. A virtual tunnel is a communications path that makes use of internet-based hosts and servers to conduct data from one network station to another, just like any other TCP IP data transmission. We have seen how the network address transition protocol works in the network security tutorials. Routers, access points, or firewall devices can assign an internal IP address to the computers connected to them and a single IP address is assigned to these devices via network address transform protocol. We are going to the internet. When we visit internet, what is my IP address.com website where can a website where can we learn our public IP address, we can view the public IP address reserved for the home router by the internal service provider. When we connect to the VPN server with the VPN protocol, a VPN tunnel will be created between our computer and VPN server, and our internet traffic will first go to VPN server within the VPN tunnel. In this way, our internal service provider or the administrator of any network device through which the traffic up the VPN server passes, will only be able to see the encrypted VPN traffic, web request, username, etc. in the tunnel. These data will not be accessible by them. This is valid for the website for which the web request goes. The website to which web request is made, it will be able to see that the request is coming from the VPN server and the requester. 
The real IP address, named the IP address of computer, will not be seen by the target server, by administrators. First, let's open the external Kali machine. After, let's go to VPN.com. VPN.com offers a free VPN service. Thanks to VPN service in Europe, you can have a stable and fast VPN service for free. Let's download the files of the server located in France. The password and username on the page will be needed by us in the next steps. Let's extract the downloaded file. Then we will run the OpenVPN TCP443 file. Before running the OpenVPN file, let's visit whatsmyipaddress.com and see the public IP address of our Kali machine assigned by the, our local ISP. We will see that this address has changed after the VPN service is running. Now we will run our OpenVPN script. Let's enter our username, VPN book. And we will now enter our password. Successfully receiving the sequence completed message indicates that VPN tunnel has formed. Let's revisit what's, what's com. As can be seen, our public IP has been changed to France IP address. Let's analyze our network traffic by running the Wireshark application. Let's visit google.com. Since our web request to google.com went through the VPN server in France, Google assumed that we were accessing it through France and presented an information page in French. Now let's visit our own website. You can find out IP address of any website from whoisdomaintools.com. Although we view the website, no traffic to our website can be displayed in the Wireshark analysis. This is because our web request first goes to VPN server within the VPN tunnel. Our traffic will be displayed in this way on all network devices up to VPN server and it will not be known which web request we actually made. Now let's close the VPN tunnel we created. Just closing the terminal session may not be enough to close the VPN tunnel. Let's view our tunnel with APA command. Let's close the tunnel with the IP link delete command. When we view our public IP address again, we will display the IP address assigned by the local ISP, since we have closed the VPN tunnel. When we visit our website again, we will see that there is a traffic to our websites on host addresses. Wireless Network Security WLANs Interconnections of computers and their components has reached a new level of quality for private users and organizations as well with the deployment of the wireless technologies. The development of the WLANs Wireless Local Area Network was a milestone in this process. Wireless local area networks bring with them their very specific security requirements. Access points. In case the mobile devices do not only want to exchange data between themselves, but stationary components are also required to serve as an interface to a local area network. These are called access points. Quite often, these components are integrated to, into a more general device offering router functions, hubs, dynamic host configuration protocol server functionality, or 
DSL modem. These devices also support network address translations. SSS ID. Each wireless network can be identified by a network designation. This name can be chosen arbitrarily and is called the service set identifier SSID. Its length can be up to 32 characters. This value can also be set to zero corresponding to operating mode any. In this case any station can hook up to the access point. Wi-Fi equivalent privacy WEP was part of the original 802.11 wireless standard introduced in 1999. While equivalent privacy provides encryption at layer 2 of the OSI model, the MAC or link layer. WEP utilizes the RC4 encryption algorithm to encrypt data and uses a shared key system. If you don't already know, WEP has been unacceptable as a secure encryption algorithm for some time now. VPA and VPA2 To compensate for the weaknesses of the VEP, proprietary mechanisms have been developed to prevent better security procedures. The Wi-Fi protected access procedure introduced by the Wi-Fi Alliance in 2002 has gained a wider circulation. VPA uses a procedure called Temporal Key Integrity Protocol. For reasons of downward compatibility, the encryption algorithm RC4 has been maintained, but instead of a permanent cheaper key, Temporal keys have been introduced. TKIP does is basically an improved variant of WEP, compromising an extended initiation vector, dynamic triple K generation, and a cryptopic message integrity check. IP Tables is a command line firewall utility that uses policy chains to allow or block traffic. When a connection tries to establish itself on your system, IP Tables looks for a rule in its list to match it to. If it doesn't find one, it resorts to the default action. In this lab, we will see how IP Tables work and harden an endpoint. During lab we will use Kali as a client machine and Metasploitable as a web server which will be hardened. First, let's check our web server's IP address. Then we will skip to our Kali and create a map TCP scan for checking services and open ports on our target server. Our scan results will be saved to the scan one file. With cat command, we will see the scan one file's contents. As you see, we have discovered many open ports and services. Now we will first list current IP tables rules. Then we will enter an IP tables rule, which will drop all incoming traffic. Now let's make again nmap scan and write results to scan to file. As you can see we cannot discover an open service. That is because of the rule which we have entered to drop all incoming traffic. Now we will open the SSH service. Before entering our rule, let's check the SSH service. It is not working. Now let's enter our rule for opening SSH service. Here we have created an exception in our input drop policy. Our policy is still working it will drop all incoming traffic except port 22.
we will scan again our target. As you see only port 22 is open. All other service discovery requests are dropped. Now we will open the HTTP service. Before let's check the web server's HTTP service. We cannot see the hosted web page. After the rule, let's check the HTTP service. Now, we can view hosted web page. We will create a new end map scan. We can see that only SSH and HTTP service is open. We will flush all IP tables rules we have created. Then we open all incoming traffic by changing the incoming traffic policy. We will have a final end map scan. As you can see all services are again discovered. A cybersecurity analyst detects cyber threats and then implements changes to protect an organization in the following ways. Manages and configures tools to monitor activity on the network. Analyzes the reports from those tools to identify unusual behavior on the network. Proactively identifies network vulnerabilities through penetration testing, vulnerability scans, and vulnerability assessment reports. Plans and recommends changes to increase the security of the network. Applies security patches to protect the network. The role of a cybersecurity analyst varies depending on company size. For example, at a small company, information security analysis and intrusion detection may be part of a larger IT role held by one person. A medium-sized company may have one full-time information security analyst who handles intrusion detection, firewalls, and antivirus software. An NTR Pyrise level cybersecurity analyst may work in a security operations center, SOC, on a team that centralizes cybersecurity efforts. A SOC team likely has several tiers of SOC analysts that monitor, detect, contain and remediate IT threats and report to a SOC manager. Cybersecurity engineers work to build and maintain a system that's safe against cyber attacks. They focus on fixing and protecting these systems and stay up to date on the new technology so they can keep their system secure. Cybersecurity engineers work closely with a company's IT team to build an emergency plan to get things up and running quickly following a disaster. Some responsibilities of a cybersecurity engineer include Creating new solutions to solve existing security issues. Enhancing security capabilities by evaluating new technologies and processes. Defining, implementing, and maintaining corporate security policies. Configuring and installing firewalls and intrusion detection systems. Responding to information security issues. Supervising changes in software, hardware, facilities, telecommunications, and user needs. Recommending modifications in legal, technical, and regulatory areas that affect IT security. A penetration tester, or pentaester, is considered a white hat or good hacker. Although they must think like a bad guy, the end goal is to help organizations improve their security practices to prevent theft and damage. Pen testers target traditional operating systems and devices as well as emerging technology, including Internet of Things, IoT, devices, mobile devices, embedded systems, and more. Some responsibilities include Applying appropriate tools for penetration testing Performing social engineering tests and reviewing physical security where appropriate 
keeping up to date with the latest testing and hacking methods. Collecting data and deploying testing methodology. Locating, assessing, and managing vulnerabilities. Making suggestions for security improvements and preparing technical responses to security questions.